Hey, well, uh, thank you very much to all of you for coming tonight. Um, <clears throat> I would like to welcome everyone who is watching us uh, via URI Live. Uh, my name is Emmy Uchida. I'm a faculty in Environmental Natural Resource Economics, um, and I'm very honored to be your host tonight. I, am, I was born in Japan and raised in Japan. I first would like to start by expressing my sympathies and condolences to all of you uh, who have loved ones uh, who, have effect, who have been affected by this tragedy, uh, especially those who have lost loved ones and those who are waiting to hear, still waiting to hear good news from the loved ones. Um, there is a small but an energetic community of Japanese people right here at URI and also in the state of Rhode Island um, sorrowed and concerned about the loved ones, families, and friends back home, and my heart goes out to them as well. I'd like to thank the five Japanese graduate students who have organized this event. Um, I'm sure it has been difficult for all of them um, watching this tragedy unfold from the other side of the earth through the internet and worrying about families and friends, wondering what they could do right here in Rhode Island. These students have turned their sorrows and their frustration to, towards something positive, and uh, they have made a concerted effort to make this event happen. Um, and I hope this forum is meaningful to all of you here, and also to all of you who are watching us from um, wherever you are <laughs> through URI Live. And um, I hope that this event will uh, lead to a sustained in interest and support towards uh, J Japan's recovery. On March 11th, uh, Japan was hit by the largest earthquake on recorded history. Coupled with tsunami that swallowed towns and villages in the northeast Japan and the nuclear crisis, the uh, Prime Minister of Japan has called this compound disaster the worst crisis since the Second World War. As of today, there are nearly 200,000 evacuees, two, more than 12,000 confirmed dead, and over 15,000 still missing. Tonight, after nearly four weeks since the earthquake, we would like to revisit this massive disaster. We'll bring together the depth of knowledge from experts from URI to help us understand the mechanisms of why we have we, we've experienced such a large disaster, the impact of this crisis to Japan and to the rest of the world, and how we can move forward from here. We also would like to take a moment to jointly send our thoughts and prayers to people in Japan and say ganbare, a phrase in Japanese to encourage people, meaning go for it or you can do it. And the person who is going to help us open the forum is President Dooley, who I understand has personal uh, connections to Japan, and we are very grateful that he could join us on a short notice. Thank you. Thank you all for, for joining us tonight. I, I, I do believe this is an important event for you or I, for the Japanese community, but for all of us. I think the images that we've probably all seen in Japan were extraordinary and stunning and in many ways unprecedented, captured for the first time in the global 21st century media, able to bring it all home to us fashion, and I think all of us were impacted and touched by the images that we could see. So for me, as, as Emmy indicated, it was uh, a moment of some personal concern, as I have uh, students in my laboratory in Montana who are from Japan. They have loved ones in the north part of Japan, not, not in the section so dramatically impacted by the tsunami, but in parts of Japan that were dramatically colleagues in Japan with whom I've collaborated for many years and I think hearing from them that that all was well one also heard about the magnitude of the disaster even in areas that were hit only peripherally. This far dwarfs Hurricane Katrina in its impact and that is something that the United States is still working hard to fix and to overcome years after it occurred. I think that illustrates the magnitude of the challenges in front of Japan and its people. And they will need our support and our help and our encouragement, our prayers and our thoughts, I think, to, to be successful. I think they are confident they can succeed. We can be confident they can succeed in rebuilding and recovering from this disaster. And I'm sure 
they will appreciate, as any of us will, the encouragement and support and understanding that we can offer them. It's a country with whom URI seeks to develop new relationships, deeper relationships. We're working on partnerships there. We'll continue to do so, I think, with the renewed effort and the renewed vigor as we go forward. So thank you all for joining us tonight. Appreciate your participation and your thoughts for our colleagues and friends. Next, I would like to welcome Reverend Lynn Baker Dooley to lead a prayer of silence. Uh, this prayer will be followed by music played by three URI students who have graciously volunteered to do so today. Gathered tonight as part of the community of the University of Rhode Island, I want to welcome all of you again and thank you for making this sacrifice of time to be with us tonight. It is appropriate for us to begin by affirming our common values of love, acceptance, and compassion, just as our presence here expresses our desire to work for peace and justice, hope, and harmony in our world. We celebrate our inclusivity as members of this community and the wider human family and gather in a respectful presence of one another. Silence is a universal spiritual practice and provides for us a means to exp express social solidarity, symbolizing and manifesting our unity in times of tragedy and triumph. I have been asked to guide our silent reflection tonight and honestly, I struggled to find the best way to express the range of feelings we share over what our brothers and sisters in Japan have been facing since this recent natural disaster. Words I read online by Safiya Foshu captured it best for me when she wrote, our hearts ache eastward for lives lost suddenly, for families swallowed by earth and water, for home and hearth gone, and memories forever changed in an instant. In these moments of silence, as we have all ached at the enormity of the devastation, let us express our heartache for the people of Japan, bereaved citizens, orphaned children, grieving families, exhausted rescue workers, frustrated public servants, so that we might not turn away, but open our ears, our eyes, our whole lives, and our resources to translate these aches into action, that through the tragedy, we may forge a new path of partnership, peace, and prosperity. Let us have a moment of silence. Let it be so. Thank you very much, Reverend. And please join me in thanking the U three URI students, Susan Gorelick from the Department of Environmental and Natural Resource Economics, Blutus Olivia Dolphin, and Rachel Start from the Music Department. Thank you very much. Uh, before turning to our experts uh, we have here, uh, we would like to revisit the natural disaster through some visuals that the uh, Japanese students have put together. Um, also, please note that in your handout, uh, there is a one-page, minute-by-minute summary of the sequence of the events.
people near the coast should evacuate immediately to higher ground if they are. That warning was extremely good advice. Green picture in northeastern Japan. An intensity of seven was reported on the uh, R studios. When earthquakes hit newsrooms, it's easy to see straight away how powerful they are. And if they're out to sea, just off the coast, then the tsunami doesn't take long to turn up. And this is a look once again at Kamaishi City in Iwate Prefecture. And it looks like the tsunami has been engulfing engulfing the port. You're seeing live footage of a tsunami engulfing the port area of Kamaishi City in Iwate Prefecture. We've been reporting earlier on that the, the meteorological agency has issued a warning for tsunami up to six meters deep, uh, six meters high, and this is what's happening right as we speak. A large tsunami engulfing the port of Kamaishi in Iwate Prefecture. While that was all happening in the northeast of Japan, Tokyo, the capital further south, was feeling it as well in different ways. TV channels showed fires burning, people trapped in high-rise buildings. Although other pictures suggested most buildings had stood up to the earthquake as they're designed to, Others have collapsed, and it's impossible to imagine the number of dead from this won't be substantial. ...to establish a special office to look into the damage to banks and other financial institutions. Geological experts have warned that while the tsunami roared west towards Japan, it's also likely to have moved north, and that means the southeastern tip of Russia near Vladivostok. There are warnings for other countries as well, as diverse as Taiwan and Hawaii. Lawrence Lee, Al Jazeera. That is the biggest earthquake to date. It is still going. Oh my God, the building's gonna fall. But it got considerably worse, so I said, oh, this is the biggest one yet. And then it didn't stop. And then it got a little bit worse, so I went to stand outside in between the two buildings. And the clanking you hear is actually the canisters of natural gas banging against each other. And that's when I said, oh my God, the buildings, the building is going to fall. I said that just before because it had never made that sound. It sounded like a shotgun or a freight train going off, just boom. Uh, thank you very much uh, for putting that together. It's, it's, it's uh, certainly shocking to see these images again, especially when they're on simultaneously. It's, it's very shocking. Um, I think we're now ready to uh, move on to the panel discussion. Um, I'd like to have all the uh, uh, to introduce all of the panelists. Um, um, <coughs> um, okay. Um, I'd like to start with uh, Professor uh, Timothy George. Uh, Timothy uh, George, Dr. Timothy George is a professor of history, and his uh, work focuses on post-war Japan. He has a PhD from Harvard University. He lived in Japan for 16 years, where his two children were born, and maintains close ties with his co contacts there. Among other areas, his research has focused on the government's historic response to some natural and uh, human-caused disasters. Um, Tim has been interviewed about Japan's earthquake and tsunami disaster by uh, multiple media sources. Uh, Professor Stefan Grilli uh, is a distinguished professor of ocean engineering, has a PhD in applied sciences of hydraulic and ocean engineering from University of Liege. 
He joined the faculty at URI in 1991 and served as the chair of the Department of Ocean Engineering from 2002 to 2008. His research and teaching interests are focused on computational wave and fluid dynamics, wave structure interaction, and science behind tsunamis. Uh, professor Baram Nasser Sharif is a distinguished professor of mechanical, industrial, and systems engineering, joining DRI in 2003. He has a PhD in nuclear engineering from Oregon State University, and he is the recipient of the National Science Foundation's pre uh, very prestige uh, Presidential Young Investigator Award and a fellow of the AAAS. His research is in the field of nuclear systems, heat transfer, computational mechanics, and non-destructive testing. Lastly, uh, Professor Doug Hales is an Associate Professor of Operations and Supply Chain Management at URI's College of Business Administration. He's joined URI in 2005 after completing his PhD in Operations and Supply Chain Management at Clemson University. His expertise include the supply chains of automotive and computer electronics industry, consumables, food industries. His research interest involves the management of global supply chains. So thank you very much for all of you for joining us tonight and appreciate your time. So uh, when there's an earthquake, we are having the meeting with my students. Uh, we, the, I have about 10 students. Uh, then in the afternoon, we had an earthquake and uh, we get out from the building, and that was about, uh, I think, 9.0 magnitude of the earthquake. And uh, until now, the more than 20,000 people are dead or are missing. That we know now. So the first earthquake was very big. It continued about 10 minutes. So none of the people can stand up, so we have to sit down and uh, uh, we have to be patient about the of the earthquake. So many people saw the building is fall out, but fortunately uh, our building was okay. And after the earthquake stopped, we tried to make sure that all people are there, it is the as uh, as our professors, so in about 10 or 20 minutes, we figure out that all people are safe, at least in our graduate school. So then uh, we try to know that using the cell phone or email of the cell phone, whether our family are okay who stayed in the uh, same town, but very few people have connected using the cell phone because uh, uh, there are so many people call each other and uh, only few, only some of them uh, get the phone connections. So, for example, in my students, including myself, only one student get connected using cell phone. So I don't know that uh, my family are okay. And uh, since we can connect it and the uh, automobile is so, uh, it's hard to go by car. We I with my students, we walk down to the street and try to go to our homes. So fortunately, our family are okay. But then, uh, because of the black clouds and uh, water and sewer uh, cannot be used, uh, there's nothing we can do in the night. So you can imagine that uh, our climate is similar to the Rhode Island. It's still cold. Uh, Sometimes we had uh, snow before the uh, earthquake. But fortunately, there's no snow after the earthquake. So it was okay relatively. 
So many people brought a sleeping bag to sleep in the night, but not all of the people could get it. So for my case, I went to my, to my home, stay with my family, but all, all students are slept in the school. Then the, each morning I, with my family, went to the school, stay with my students. So I brought some food and water. Uh, then uh, our campus in the mountainside. So it's not easy to connect it to the cell phone. And uh, I couldn't get from the uh, friends. And this situation is same as my, all my colleagues. So usually we brought uh, water and dried food. Often it's a snack because these are the only food that we can get. Uh, then we try to survive and I try to cheer up the other students because they seem to be so tired. I find the uh, international students tired more because they are not used to the earthquake itself. And then the, our graduate school itself, uh, they had a, a stocked water and dried food. So I'm able to distribute this food to the other school people. So the good thing is uh, uh, people help each other to bring food or drink. So first uh, two or three days, all the stores were closed. But in the next week, uh, some stores are opened. They are not fully open. And then the, our graduate school itself, uh, they had a, a stocked water and dried food. So I'm able to distribute this food to the other school people. So the good thing is that uh, uh, people help each other to bring food or drink. So first uh, two or three days, all the stores were closed, but in the next week, uh, some stores are opened. They are not fully open. Uh, good. So they only sell the um, basic water and food in front of the store. So usually we wait in line for about five hours, and then we are able to buy food. So sometimes people go there and uh, get the food and try to distribute each other. So this is the way that we did in the uh, first and second week. And uh, basic information was provided by radio but they keep telling the same story, so we are not sure that when uh, next big earthquake come or uh, tsunami have potential impact to us. So all the news was not uh, encouraging. Uh, then the school told us that uh, all the students have to get out from the, uh, our campus or Sendai city to avoid the uh, uh, tsunami and the uh, next earthquake. So I arranged all my students to find uh, their hometown using the uh, bus to ask my friends in the email to have a temporary office. So only few people could use the car because uh, uh, we are out of the gas in many gas stations. So we have to wait like two days to get the 
uh, 10 liters gas. So it was very difficult. Then after I sent all my students to the other place, I, by myself, with two students, uh, we went to the uh, Akita. This is a uh, uh, north way of Japan, which is about 10, 100 kilometers away from the uh, Sendai, which is a place that I stayed. So we drive and uh, stay two days to get the seat of the uh, air, airplane. Then using the flight, I went back to the my hometown of uh, Fukuoka, which is a south city of Japan. So then I sometimes go back in forth of the uh, Tokyo or other place. And next, next week, I'm trying to get back to my university. Okay. So well, usually mm -hmm. that's good. Yes? Yes, um, I, I, it's just very different when we hear these uh, stories from um, a person that we know and person related to um, our university. Um, so you are going back to to, um, to back to Tohoku next week. Um, are you taking your family with you, and how do you um, um, at a later time? Thank you very much for your time. Um, we would like to move on to um, our four uh, panelists um, here um, we have uh, today. Um, I have asked each panelist to prepare a five-minute presentation. Uh, the presentations will be followed um, by uh, several questions from me to the panelists, and then we will open the questions um, to um, everyone uh, from the audience. So, uh, Tim, I'd like to start with you. Natural disasters, earthquakes, and tsunamis are dramatic natural processes, but not natural disasters until they affect humans and their built environments. But every part of the March 11 triple disaster, earthquake, tsunami, and of course the Fukushima accident. As is the case with every so called natural disaster, has had the results it has because of the choices and actions of human beings. So, where these disasters occur matters a great deal. Had this happened anywhere else, the tragedies would have played out differently in many ways. Consider recent disasters such as the Haitian earthquake or the Indian Ocean earthquake and tsunami. Japan is one of the world's wealthiest, most advanced, most high-tech, best educated, most literate, longest-lived, most crime-free, most pacifist countries, and one of America's closest allies, and also, of course, the most experienced uh, and prepared for earthquakes and tsunamis. It even gave us the word tsunami. Half its coastline is lined with concrete like you see here, to defend, it was hoped, against tsunamis. Had there been only a 9.0 earthquake, we would be marveling at the limited destruction caused by the fifth largest earthquake ever recorded. No other people are so well prepared. Had there been only a 9.0 earthquake plus a tsunami, tsunami larger than any ever seen on that coast for over a millennium, our reaction would be shocked at these latest reminders that even the world's most advanced technology and preparation cannot always protect us from nature. And now, by now, much of the focus uh, would have shifted to understanding how the planners could have been so wrong about the potential tsunami sizes. But, of course, that's not all that happened in Japan is now dealing with the worst nuclear accident since Chernobyl, and will be for a long, long time, which makes this triple disaster unlike 
anything that Japan or any other country has ever experienced. We naturally try to make sense of shockingly unprecedented events through the lenses of events with which we are familiar. We look to history, especially when the images are so eerily similar to those of past events. But at the risk of arguing against the importance of what I do as a historian, I would argue that the differences with past events are at least as important as the similarities. Japan's history of overcoming adversity does not offer a clear blueprint for today. We now uh, see that Japan will have to find a new uh, Let me look at some of the past events that come to mind. The great Anse earthquake of 1855. Uh, now we blame electric tectonics, then people blame giant catfish. Earthquakes and tsunamis have occurred on Japan's northeast coast, where this one occurred in the past, in 1896, in 1953, in 1960, and they led planners to accept, uh, expect much smaller tsunamis, three meters or so, was what they thought they would expect until they built the walls to protect against five meter tsunamis. The great Kanto earthquake of 1920 devastated much of Tokyo and Yokohama, killed perhaps 140,000 people, most by fire. And annual earthquake drills occur on its anniversary, September 1st, throughout the nation. Tokyo and over 60 cities were incinerated by American firebombs by the summer of 1945 that made a quarter of the nation homeless. Of course, that was a much younger population. The very old population of the Americans devastated by this tsunami. Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 1945. Japan is, of course, the only nation to suffer nuclear attack, uh, but those were one pulse emissions of radiation. But this included uh, to quite safe levels within hours or days. The Hanshin earthquake in Kobe, Osaka in 1995 killed over 6,400 people, some due to the government's slow bureaucratic response. Uh, and this time, its immediate acceptance of help from the United States and other nations shows it learned its lessons from Kobe. The Hanshin quake also saw for the first time a massive massive outpouring of assistance from civil society groups, a very active now as well. The longer the Fukushima reactor problems continue, uh, the more similarities I see uh, with the Minamata disease mercury poisoning and other pollution incidents I've studied. Fishing cooperatives lost their means of livelihood when no one could buy their fish. Token sympathy payments to victims without admitting legal responsibility. Corporate responsibility became the focus of landmark lawsuits, as will undoubtedly happen with TEPCO, the Tokyo Electric Power Company. And the responsibility of government for allowing such an accident to happen, for not responding a more rapidly and effectively, was also questioned. Government eventually bought bonds sold by the company. In order to give it the revenue stream it needed uh, to pay compensation, and something similar may well happen with TEPCO now. The government's responses have been hampered by the fact that the current administration is so weak. The Democratic Party ousted the long-entrenched Liberal Democratic Party in 2009 and has not yet developed the experience and the ties that enable a ruling party to work effectively with the bureaucrats who do most of the actual governing of Japan. Uh, the emperor, Akihito, made an extraordinary pre-recorded address to the nation, only the second time that had ever been done. But unlike his father, who broadcast in August 1945, informed the nation that he had lost the war, 
Today's emperor has no power in trying to solve some problems the government has caused others, as when it closed roads to the northeast to all but emergency vehicles, thereby blocking normal deliveries of food and fuel. Petro hasn't looked good either. It may well have delayed using salt water to cool the reactors and spin fuel in the hope that the plant could still be saved. Civil society groups, as I suggested, quickly went into action, but have been slowed by travel restrictions, fears of litigation, and the sheer enormity of the disaster of what seemed to me the brightest spot in the range of these monsters. I'm a historian, not a futurologist, so while my heart goes out to the people of the country in which I've spent so long, I can't predict what future historians will say 311 meant for Japan. Pessimists fear that this disaster may be almost unbearable for a country with an economy that has grown little over the past 20 years and has one of the world's most rapidly aging populations and highest levels of government debt. Optimists hope that this will be a turning point and that the nation will rediscover and redefine where it is and where it is going. Uh, but only time will tell. We can help. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> next, we have uh, Professor Gurley from uh, Department of o Ocean Engineering. volume of water creating inundation. We've all seen that on movies. And um, we like to picture a tsunami as a huge wave crashing on a beach, but unfortunately behind it there is a huge volume of water that keeps coming at you for minutes and minutes, 15, 20 minutes at time, creating inundation that reached the case of Japan as far inland as uh, five kilometers at some places. Uh, the death toll is rising by, by the minute, I would say. Uh, it's published almost daily by uh, the Japanese agencies. And so far, we have uh, a number of uh, dead and missing, uh, over 27,000, and many, many, many displaced. But even so, this is a great tragedy. If we compare it to the 2004 uh, Indonesian and Indian Ocean tsunami, on which I worked quite a bit as well, uh, there, there was almost 300,000 uh, in largely unprepared countries, mostly in Indonesia and Thailand. Uh, Japan was probably the best prepared country in the world to face this disaster. And, and despite this unbearable death toll, I think it's a success for, uh, in a way, the people who created the forecasting system. They saved a lot of lives. So things have to be put in perspective. Um, I was asked. I, I may have to try to adjust it. It's not going to be visible. I was asked to uh, present a few facts about tsunami. One of them is, how are they created? Well, in the case of a co-seismic tsunami created directly by an earthquake, it's all about subduction plates. So uh, the entire Atlantic Ocean is riding, uh, actually it's overriding a huge plate that moves eastward and westward at about near the Japan Trench, 80 millimeters per year, and it's subducting under the Euro-Asian plate, 
uh, under Japan. So most of the time, the plate does not move. It's stuck against uh, the overlying plate, and it accumulates just like a spring loaded system. It accumulates deformation. And periodically, that deformation in, is released into an earthquake that creates shaking, oscillations of the sea floor that translate into oscillations of the ocean surface. As water is not very compressible, any deformation on the sea floor will be transmitted on the surface. And then that hump of water will propagate towards shore and offshore. That will create coastal inundations as shared with that. Um, Well, this is uh, an animation of the rupture of um, this earthquake, as you can recreate through seismic inversion. So using the measurements and a lot of seismographs uh, all over the world, you can recreate the rupture. You can see that the main rupture lasted for two to three minutes, and then was followed by a quiet period, and then uh, later on by another rupture. So we use as modern earthquakes to um, recreate a source of tsunami and then to try to set up computer models that uh, use this uh, bottom deformation. So behind me, uh, this is Japan and the Japan plan. And then this uh, rectangle is actually the slip. And the scale of it goes up to 18 meters. So this shows you that in the redder area, the plate slipped by 18 meters. Some models predict even more than that. Now, that slipping, of course, translated into movement of the sea floor. All those red dots are, are aftershocks during the first 10 hours. So an earthquake is, of course, started as we like to picture it as an epicenter. But as you can see here, it spread. It spread over 500 kilometers in length and 300 kilometers in width. And then it was followed by many, many aftershocks. Uh, the most violence occurred the same day, up to 7.2. So itself, the same earthquake has destroyed Haiti. And then many, many more followed. Uh, again, if this had not been Japan, the, the damage would have been a lot uh, uh, stronger, at, particularly at the buildings in Tokyo. Uh, these are the aftershocks three days later. You can see a much higher density of aftershocks. So using, using all that information, we recreate by modeling seafloor deformation. So here on the scale that you cannot see, the redder part is 15 meters of uplift. And there is a, the, the blue scale is uh, down subsidence of down to five, six meters. As you may have heard, Japan is now permanently uh, moved horizontally by six meters. Some places are uplifted by one meter, one meter and others uh, subducting by about the same amount. These are permanent changes. The, the mass on the Earth has redistributed. So this is, these are formidable um, energies that we can't even uh, uh, understand. But we can see in the, the just the changes that this caused that that energy is formidable. It, 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 for those who know the amounts, it's in the order of 10 to the 29th in joules, which is the typical amount of energy. So these are mind-boggling energies. So using that deformation, we can recreate a numerical model of a tsunami. And this is the one we've set up in California. Uh, you can see the propagation of the tsunami offshore, but also onshore. Of course, that is the problem in this particular case. Onshore was very close. In terms, in terms of tsunami propagation, it was 10, 15 minutes away. Uh, when I woke up on, on that day, I got my first, I looked at my emails already at 30. The first email was issued nine minutes after the event by the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center and already forecasted most of the right parameters for the earthquake and the tsunami. Now, all the areas that had time to react were prepared, but the Sendai area that was just very nearby had no time for warning. They, of course, had sirens and, and they, they are used to tsunamis, so a lot of people did the right thing, but many people were caught by surprise in, in the coastal communities. Now, you can see, of course, that this tsunami 
all over the world, um, particularly in the Pacific Ocean, but it was felt worldwide in, in all the tide gauges. You can see the signal. And um, in, uh, well, this, the scale here is, um, is hidden again, but NOAA has uh, come down with their own uh, predictions very, very early. In the first few hours, they were already predicting what would happen in Hawaii and in uh, the west coast of the United States. California was hit. This was the hardest tsunami in the past um, 20, 30 years with over 50 million damage, but it's, of course, nothing compared to Japan. But Chile was also Galapagos and wave guiding effects that caused a lot of uh, uh, Wave action. This is just an example of a tide gauge in Washington. As you can see, the black box uh, on the third line. So, at those different places in, on Washington, in Washington State, the elevation was about 10, 20 centimeters. It didn't cause much damage, but in some harbors, um, boats started swirling around and they had to be protected. Now, more importantly, of course, for Japan is what happened in the near field. Now, those Arrow marks uh, indicate where the run-up was greater than three meters. So you can see a high concentration of data there. And the Japanese scientists have already measured. Now this you can read from maps. So you can see ten dots for um, seven to eight meters. You can see for Funato for eleven meter, twenty three meters runup. There is a So all of these are being measured right now. So in some places, the water elevation, not the runoff, which is against the hills, was 12, 13 meters. So there is nothing you can do against this. And as you've seen on the movie, it's not just water. It's water with all, of, all the debris that the, that the tsunami has, has used. So it's a big blender, and it destroys everything. So one big question that will be asked is, what happened at the nuclear power plant? our own simulation with the most recent data of the wave elevation at the power plant. So we predicted over 10 meters with this particular tsunami, 10 to 11 meters. 12 meters were measured. The sea walls were six and a half meters. Now, whose responsibility is this? Well, certainly not the Japanese tsunami scientists. They knew about the possibilities for large sources, but whoever designed those sea walls, it was uh, mostly the plant owners, uh, they actually use very different scenarios. They didn't use uh, the largest possible scenarios. And when they built their seawalls, they also trusted them very much. So uh, the safety, uh, the power generation, uh, diesel generators were put in the basement, not on the second or third floor as they could have done that. So there were a lot of compounded effects uh, that led to this disaster, but it could have been expected based on historical data. So this is a historical map released in Japan. Uh, the square show all the observed tsunamis, quite a lot, and, and the large squares are over five meter elevation for those tsunamis. Uh, the red dots are all the earthquakes that generated tsunamis. And so this is only since 1900. A lot, a lot of tsunamis. And this is a tsunami that was researched by one Japanese colleague from 1896, and it actually flooded um, two and a half miles inland, one of the areas that was flooded is a picture from the March 11th tsunami. So same exact scenario. So if you look back in history far enough, here's a, a case where people say three meters. No, 1933, they measured 29 meters. At that location that was measured by Japanese scientists and reported in a book. So these things existed. So it's a matter, of course, as engineers, you have to take a realistic scenario and, and a return period, and they may not have done so. So I will stop here um, because I was only given uh, so much time, but I have more slides regarding tsunamis in Rhode Island because we're working on this for NOAA right now. I've been um, granted by uh, the National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program to prepare inundation maps for the entire East Coast. So we have this three-year project with some of the students involved that are sitting in this room. And uh, we are just at the beginning, but if you have questions about that, I, I, I can show you those slides later. Thank you. Thank
Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'd like to have uh, Professor Nasser Sharif. I'll focus my remarks mostly on the nuclear power plants and the sequence of events that took place there. But I want to say ahead of time that my heart really goes out to the people of Japan, uh, but also to all of the workers, engineers, uh, technicians uh, that have been working the front line at these nuclear power plants trying to uh, put them back into safe condition. Uh, they have really, uh, in my opinion, they, they're heroes of Japan in many ways. Um, so to kind of put things in perspective, um, it's, it's good to take a look at where Japan stands in terms of its use of nuclear power uh, in the world scene. Uh, this is a short list. This is just the top 12 countries as far as their megawatt capacity of installed capacity, and then also the percentage of electrical power production coming from nuclear um, in these various uh, countries. So Japan uh, is number three on the list uh, with over 47,000 megawatts of power, uh, making up for about 30% uh, of its uh, national electrical power production. In terms of number of plants uh, and how that translates into how many nuclear power plants uh, exist or operating on the construction, uh, planned, or proposed, uh, again, this is a list of the top uh, 12 United States being number one in terms of number of plants, uh, France number two with 58, and Japan with 55 operating uh, nuclear power plants. That, that number now will be uh, 51 after this incident. Uh, the number under construction is two. Uh, there was two nuclear power plants actually under construction at the Fukushima Daiichi site, in addition to the four that, that went through the accident. Uh, they have 12 plant plants and uh, one proposed. In terms of the geography of where these plants are located, uh, the Fukushima Daiichi uh, site, uh, which was the site that was affected, uh, was uh, closest to the site of the earthquake. Uh, and it saw the initial wave of the tsunami, so those plants uh, suffered the most damage. Uh, but there was a total of 11 nuclear power plants that were affected by the earthquake. All 11 plants uh, shut down um, because they have seismic sensors, uh, so uh, the control rods were inserted as soon as the first seismic waves hit. Uh, that shuts down the nuclear fission process. Uh, the power levels dropped immediately to about 10 to 8 percent of the normal operating power, so there's a lot less energy, which is in the form of PKP, uh, that is caused by the uh, results of the fission process. That heat still needs to be removed, uh, and these reactors in particular uh, that saw the wave of the tsunami that were affected by lost their emergency core cooling systems, which are essentially pumps uh, that pump water through storage tanks into the reactor and through heat exchangers to maintain the cooling of those reactors. So the site that uh, was affected, the Fukushima Daiichi site, uh, had six power plants power plants um, about 200 miles from uh, Tokyo. Uh, the plants uh, are all designed of a uh, General Electric company in the United States. Uh, they were built, uh, the earliest one was built in 1971. Uh, and then number, so that was unit number one, that was the first plant that was affected, and with 74, 76, 78 uh, built years uh, for the remaining three. Uh, they're essentially all the same design Notice they're all Mark One EWR boiling water reactor designs. Um, these are uh, more popular in Japan, this type of design. We have a much smaller percentage of this type of reactor design here in the US. Of 104 US reactors, approximately 24 are of a boiling water reactor design, and even fewer of the Mark One type design. Again, it has to do mostly with the age uh, of these plants. 
uh, the two other units, five and six, that really have not made it to the news have been uh, uh, under observation by everyone uh, because we were concerned about them as well. Uh, those are newer designs, um, also higher power levels for both of those plants, but they were slightly offset back, uh, so they were not affected by the tsunami wave uh, in the way that the first four reactors <laughs> were affected. Also, unit number four at the time of the earthquake and tsunami uh, was not operating. That, that unit was uh, defueled, so the fuel had been removed from the reactor. The top of the reactor was open, and all the fuel was sitting in a fuel storage pool. Uh, I have a picture that I'll show you. So this is the picture of the site. This is before the event uh, took place. This is a top view of it, uh, kind of, of the whole site where everything is located. Japan does reprocess its nuclear fuel. Um, and that's something that we do not do here in the US. Uh, so they actually take their used fuel and run it to a reprocessing facility to uh, extract the remaining uh, good materials out of the fuel and therefore reduce the amount of waste that they generate as a result of that. Uh, so on March 11th, um, uh, to talk about the earthquake itself, Tim made a really good point. Japan is no stranger to earthquakes. Uh, there has been many, many, many earthquakes and uh, seismologists, when they look at these, uh, uh, they uh, are always asked uh, to come up with kind of worst case scenarios uh, when civil engineers go to work to design these kinds of facilities. Uh, and they look at not so much the rector scale magnitude of the earthquake, but more the lateral acceleration that's generated during the earthquake that's more important from an engineering point of view. Uh, so these plants were designed for roughly a magnitude 8 to 8.4 on a rector scale uh, type of earthquake. Uh, that translates to a lateral trans uh, acceleration force of about 0.45 Gs. Uh, the earthquake generated about 0.51 G uh, force uh, at the plant. If it was just the earthquake, uh, there is enough safety factors built in into engineering designs that probably the plants would have survived uh, without damage. Uh, but unfortunately, that wasn't the only thing that happened. Uh, the tsunami that followed the event uh, took out the emergency core cooling systems at the reactor. So this, this just shows the magnitude of uh, the forces uh, that were felt at the different locations. Uh, much of the force was the locations closest to the earthquake, uh, and that, that's, that's where the plants are located, just south of uh, Sendai. And this is just the USGS map of some of the earthquakes in Japan. This is from 1990. And uh, if you take the scale back to 1900, the map just fills with color, and you can't even see the difference. Uh, so earthquakes have been uh, prominent in Japan, and uh, designers of building facilities and structures have paid close attention to historical uh, uh, limits that have been observed, and uh, they, they really have, uh, it's a country that's the most advanced country in the world as far as any, any build for earthquake proofing of buildings and, and structures. Uh, this was beyond anything that anyone could imagine or had experienced. Uh, this is a cutout of uh, a typical uh, General Electric Mark I nuclear power plant. Uh, the four units that were affected are of this design. Uh, so to just kind of explain uh, what it looks like in terms of containment, because I think that's one issue that has been in the news quite a bit. Uh, there's essentially four tiers of containment of the nuclear materials in, in a reactor like this. First of all, there is uh, the fuel itself, which is uranium dioxide. In most cases, in one of these plants, there was an experimental fuel uranium dioxide with plutonium oxide mixture. Um, uh, I can talk about that separately. So that fuel is enclosed inside rods that are made of um, zircaloy, which is an alloy of zirconium. And then they're encased in uh, nine by nine bundles, and those bundles are then encased in zirconium casings uh, to help with the fluid flow through those. Um, and then some 200 of those fuel assemblies are then inserted into the, into the core of the reactor, which sits inside uh, the reactor vessel, which is six to eight inches of steel that surrounds that fuel. Um, the 
piping that comes out carries out steam uh, that goes into a turbine and generator facility to produce electricity. All of that then is sitting inside what's called the primary containment. And that primary containment is uh, the third layer of protection. And then all the one on the outside is the main building itself, which provides a fourth layer of protection. So in the case of these uh, three plants, uh, what the sequence of events that they went through uh, was that part of the core was exposed uh, because of loss of cooling accident. The decay heat uh, boiled some of the water off, um, essentially. And the exposure to the core, zirconium is a metal that uh, starts reacting with steam at a temperature of about 1,000 Kelvin. So at those temperatures, then you start getting oxidation of zirconium. It produces hydrogen as a result of this chemistry. Uh, hydrogen is a very light gas. It tends to rise, and uh, it can also get through very, very small uh, pores and cavities. Uh, so that hydrogen gas eventually made its way uh, into the lower structure, which is a torus, this donut-shaped structure at the bottom of the reactor, uh, which is a suppression pool. That's, that's where they depressurize the steam out of. Uh, and made it to the top of the building. So the explosions that we observed uh, on TV, uh, which were uh, incredible to see, uh, were hydrogen explosions that took place in the upper uh, portion of the outer containment. Uh, so that leaves that primary containment, and all the reports that I've seen, the primary containments remain intact in all of these reactors, uh, which I think says a lot about the engineering They were able to withstand that kind of a force. Uh, unit number three seems to have uh, suffered the most massive explosion. The most amount of hydrogen was generated in that reactor. So after the initial incidence of the loss of emergency core cooling system, the normal operating procedure is that uh, after uh, the existing sources of water are exhausted, uh, which are there are several storage pools in the building itself, uh, as well as outside tanks that hold fresh water, purified water. Uh, once those sources are uh, exhausted, then the normal operating procedure, uh, the lack of any source of power, which they did not have as a result of the tsunami, much of the electrical grid infrastructure was destroyed also. So there was no way to run electricity to the plant, uh, or to any of these plants, uh, uh, even days after the incident itself. Uh, they, were, they were faced with uh, the last step in the operating procedure, which the plant with seawater, which primarily covers the outside of the vessel. It doesn't go inside the vessel, and it cools the outside of the vessel to reduce the temperature that's being generated. This just shows the layout of where the turbine buildings are located. The turbine buildings were the first buildings in front of the tsunami wave. There were shorter buildings that are wider, uh, and the actual reactor itself sits in the taller buildings. And these are the two unit number one and unit number three explosions. There were hydrogen explosions. Uh, and, and there were really not significant amounts of radiation that were produced as a result of these two explosions. And this is a picture of the site uh, after the explosions. This is a site picture. Uh, the buildings, the upper part of the building suffered significant amounts of damage as a result of the explosions. Uh, but the primary containments Uh, there's a scale that International Atomic Energy Agency uses for uh, rating uh, nuclear accidents uh, and incidents. Uh, different incidents end up on different scales of this. Uh, to give you a perspective, uh, the Three Mile Island accident in the United States that happened more than 25 years ago uh, would rate number five on this scale in terms of level of its severity. Uh, the Chernobyl incident was a number seven on this scale, uh, and the uh, accident in Japan would rate at that same level five as the three mile incident. Now, a few things could have been different. Uh, in retrospect, we all go back and we look at these kinds of events, and we always ask ourselves, what could we have done differently? What could, could we have done uh, in a better way to protect uh, these plants. And uh, in the United States, I went back and, and read some research papers from 1989. As early as 1989, uh, there was uh, 
research studies done in the United States about hydrogen uh, generation possibility and the potential for hydrogen fires and explosions. Uh, so in the United States, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission has required several different kinds of changes to our plants. Uh, one is that uh, there's hardened vents that are installed at all BWR Mark 1s in the United States. These vents are specifically designed to release hydrogen. So even if the hydrogen is igniting, uh, the vents are designed to withstand those kinds of fire temperatures. Uh, the second thing that uh, would have really helped would have been additional backup auxiliary generators uh, and perhaps a different location for them. Uh, so again, here in the United States, we have uh, two diesel generators per plant uh, with a, an additional outside portable pump generator that sits for emergency situations. Uh, the other thing that would have helped would have been more battery power, longer storage of battery power uh, to mitigate or to provide power for the pumps. So those are some things that, that perhaps could have been done differently. The tsunami walls could have been built higher uh, and, and many other things. Uh, but we're looking at these events and I think it's a learning experience for all engineers, scientists, uh, and humans that look at these events and, and learn from them and we can only hope that we will do Thank you very much, uh, Professor, uh, Mr. Sharif. Uh, lastly, uh, we'd like to have uh, Professor Doug Hales uh, give us a presentation, um, Associate Professor of Operations and Supply Chain Management at URI's College of Business Administration. Thank you, and thank you uh, for inviting me today. Um, first of all, a lot of this has been in the press already, so I'm going to tell you what you probably already heard in the beginning, but then at the end, tell you some of the numbers that are out there about what has been boarded as one of the largest economic disasters that will occur in Japan. And I, quite frankly, do not believe the data supports that. So let me walk through some of this, and I'll end up telling you what I don't think will happen there that is, the press is really pushing, which has actually hurt uh, and will hurt some of the recovery efforts there. But let me begin by saying, first of all, there's roughly 200,000 products of which Japan makes as part of global supply chains. Most of those have multiple sources, except for four major ones, and those are the automobile industry, um, memory chips for some of the high-end computers, especially RAM memory, the food industry for certain types of specialized products, and tourism. Now up there I say U.S. economic effects, and you see down there Thailand. I know that Thailand is not in the United States, but I do that for uh, comparison purposes. So before you see that and understand what this guy's thinking about, I'm sure he's in College of Business, he knows money, but doesn't know geography, uh, that's not the case. But let me begin with Toyota. First of all, Toyota sole sources some of its high-end electronics for its automobiles uh, only in Japan. And they do that for several reasons. But beginning next week, Toyota facilities will be, begin to close in the U.S. Now, what they've done, like a lot of industries do, they start to consolidate the rare electronics into a few facilities that they will keep running. But they're not planning layoffs for those employees. They're planning to do some plant upgrades and keep those employees employed. Secondly, they said that we are not going to exploit this because the price of these cars of the most popular models could rise. And Toyota is telling its dealership not to let that happen. So they're really concerned about maintaining uh, their image considering in the last few years they've had a pretty tough time uh, in doing so. Honda and Nissan are taking similar steps. But the Toyota facilities in the northern part of Japan, middle to north, have not yet reopened and probably won't reopen at least for another 30 uh, to 60 days. Next, memory chips. Uh, chips. Most of the high-end computer memory chips are made there, some of the best ones. There are some other sources for those things. However, Japan has had some of the best technology, the best quality uh, that are available, and PDAs and cell phones will also be affected. So you're likely going to see some shortages of those until they can find other sources for that. And lastly, the food industry. 25 countries so far have restricted Japanese food imports. Uh, one of the largest imports, India, has done so beginning for about 30 to 90 day period. Once they uh, do some evaluation of the food products, they could restore doing so. However, that will take some time. The good benefit of that is a lot of the Japanese food products are actually sourced out of China, like a lot, a lot of other things. And even though they've been distributed through Japan, but Kobe beef and certain types of rice uh, will be affected at the Japanese locations and seafood. It's only 40 hours from uh, the sea 
of Japan to your plate in the U.S. That's how short the supply chain is. So those products are now being restricted uh, fairly heavily. There is some in the supply chain uh, that were frozen that's going out there, but the customers don't like it. So until there's some testing method, those have been the greatest uh, restriction. Next is tourism. Hawaii, for example, relies on Japan for $2 billion per year of tourism. Uh, it's roughly one ninth of that now. Uh, Thailand, for example, in U.S. dollars in comparison, relies on Japanese tourists for $99 million. Uh, they're expecting that to be down to almost $9 million. So in terms of that, there are effects within the U.S. and around the world. Japanese are very good tourists, and they like to travel, and they like to see things. So those numbers are going to be down. Um, and most of this has been in the press. But within Japan itself, it's had to increase food imports by almost 10% because there are food shortages there and there's some concern over radiation and contamination. Uh, so they still have not got good food supplies into that northern area. But they also have reduced the raw material and components imports by 75%. Now that means some of the heavy raw materials they use for industry are down and a lot of those were, for, were sourced from China, forcing some of the Chinese uh, within the next couple of weeks. Next, there is a real loss of GDP. Japan just was supplanted by China as from the second to the third largest economy in the world, which was about $15.4 trillion. I estimate that roughly 200 to $350 billion will be lost in real GDP um, beginning this year. And unfortunately, Japan also has a debt problem. Its GDP or its debt is roughly 225% of its GDP, and this is likely to increase that close to 300%. For the central government ratio of debt to revenue, it's roughly 20 to 1. So Japan doesn't have a lot of room, uh, unfortunately, to borrow money to recover. And its infrastructure spending it actually took 3% of that gross domestic product and loaned it outside the country. Now you say, why would a country take its heavily debted, take part of its money and loan it? It's because it can build interest. But yet, that is now being uh, that will not occur at least for the next five to six years because that money is doing badly for the infrastructure. And lastly, one of the asset tests for tourism is the Cherry Blossom Festival, which is in full swing. 200 to a decade ago, they would, Japan was roughly getting $300 billion in tourism from that and residual tourism. Uh, due to the uh, downturn in the economy, that dropped to around 150 or $200 billion. Unfortunately, it is down to expecting to go to about $10 billion off of what they were anticipating to billion for the economy. So unfortunately, the Cherry Blossom Festival uh, is not going well there. Now, that doesn't sound great. However, Japan will recover from this. We know they will. They've recovered from worse things. So here are some things that are in the press that I think is absolutely garbage. There's no data to back it up. First of all, third largest economy in the world defaulting on its debt. We must understand that that debt sounds large, but 95% of it is owed to Japanese citizens and to businesses. It is not like the U.S., where most of it is owed to other countries, including China and Japan and Canada. So therefore, even if those loans are defaulted, its actual ability to raise money because of the culture in Japan will not likely be affected. So it doesn't do a lot of financing outside its own country. Next, there are some 90-day cooling off periods for Japanese products around the world testing automobile exports or radiation. Um, so they're said, well, there'll be some permanent loss of seafood, there'll be permanent loss of some other things, uh, but the reality is tourism was already down. And yes, that's gonna take some years for people to uh, feel comfortable traveling there and for the Japanese to feel comfortable traveling in abroad. So probably that $300 billion is gone for the next five or six years. But the reality is the sea disperses the nuclear waste fairly quickly. So it is unlikely that it will be in the food chain for very long. So my opinion is we'll test those. Every country will test those. We'll find out that the contamination is probably gone after 90 days and the food supply chain will be uh, reengaged. And of course, nuclear power, they're going to have to pay more money for some petrochemical, some uh, petroleum and things like that to generate the lost power. And that will take a hit to the bottom line of a lot of companies there. But the last thing that is really don't understand. Japan has some of the best health care related to treatment of radiation in the world. They pioneered some techniques there. Yet I keep hearing about this health crisis that they can't handle it. I just don't believe it. They've handled larger things before. The health care expertise is there. 
if anything comes out of this, the northern part of Japan is going to be rebuilt. Uh, as hard as it was to see Atlanta burned during the Civil War and Chicago burned by Miss O'Leary's cow, as hard as those things were, those cities were able to rebuild with better and newer technology buildings. And I think Japan will do the same thing. We'll actually come out with some better technology, as well as just learning how to build better nuclear reactors. I think this new government will learn quickly. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Hales. Um, I'd like to ask just one question in the interest of time and then open the uh, questions to the floor. Um, the question is, is this crisis in Japan a wake-up call for the U.S.? And if so, in what sense? If any of the panelists can comment on that, I'd appreciate it. On the tsunami side, it's clear that the U.S. Uh, is facing a potentially large tsunami on the West Coast uh, from the cascade that we just uh, That's a major subduction zone on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. The last time it, it moved, it was in 1700, and there is an entire book written on the tsunami it caused and the effect in Japan it caused. It was in Japan an effect of about four and a half meters of elevation. So the effect on the U.S. East Coast back then was not very well known. It was in 1700. Uh, so, Cascadia has been uh, studied extensively and people of uh, California are interested in Oregon and been comparing to a very different one. So uh, the, the average return period over the past uh, two millennia is about 500 years. So we are near 310 years since the last event, but some have occurred in more interval from 11 and 200. So it could be years or it could be a couple of hundred years. I think the biggest lesson I tell my students, the new four-letter word is D-E-B-T. It's called debt. It'll keep you doing things you don't want to do. Uh, I think the U.S. needs to learn a lesson that we can't survive on debt because if we do, when we have a natural disaster, we have a little place to go to finance it. And number two, uh, we need to learn that even when we do finance debt, that it should be done internally. For years, economists said during the Reagan administration that debt at the federal level does not matter. And it may not matter as much if it's owned by its internal citizens, but the U.S. has sold most of its debts outside the states. And so I think we can learn from Japan uh, how risky that could be. And Japan has done the right thing, trying to keep most of its debt, while large, internal to its own citizens. Okay. As far as the nuclear issue is concerned, uh, there's already uh, movements in the United States as far as the regulatory bodies. Uh, asked to uh, review the status of all nuclear plants in the United States, which I think is always prudent to do that uh, when we have events that uh, surpass any imaginable event that has happened in the past. Uh, so that, that, is, that is going to happen and as it is happening in the United States, particularly with respect to uh, areas that might be uh, susceptible to earthquakes. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, welcome any questions from the floor. Uh, since this, has, this is broadcasted uh, uh, through URI Live, I ask that questions uh, be asked uh, using the microphone. There are two in the middle of the hallway. So if anyone has any questions, um, I would like to uh, welcome them. I'd like to ask Professor Nasser Sharif, how long do you think it will take for this nuclear catastrophe to come under control? How will it control? As far as the reactors are concerned, uh, those are essentially under control now. And, and they were pretty much under control at the time that they were able to run power cables uh, to those plants and operate their pumps. Uh, now, as far as uh, the amount of seawater and other water that they, they uh, poured on the reactors because they wanted to keep the fuel uh, storage pools uh, filled with water, which is on the upper deck of the reactors in the very upper part. Uh, so there's a lot of water that was used, and that water may have leached out some of the uh, contamination that, that uh, may have uh, been present perhaps in the suppression pool. Uh, it wouldn't be large amounts of radioactivity, but there would be some. Uh, particularly iodine seems to be very trans uh, transporting kind of a nuclei that uh, 
starts with some kind of a vapor form, and once it gets into the steam and water, then it can move around fairly easily. Uh, other things such as cesium and strontium, which would be kind of the more abundant elements, those are not as mobile. Uh, so um, as far as what you're seeing in the seawater and, and the water that they're now um, having to uh, eject uh, from uh, one of their tanks, which is a lower contamination level of water, they need those storage tanks so they can move uh, some of the water that collected in the basements, which is more radioactive, into a storage facility so that they can actually go into those areas and start their recovery. Uh, so I think for the most part, the, the, the crisis uh, is under control, uh, but there's still a lot to do. These were three uh, large nuclear power plants, each one with a little bit different kind of a problem that developed plus the storage pools. That, that, so they, they need to stay on top of this and continue their work. The work is not done, but I, I think things are on track. Thank you. Any other questions uh, from the audience? No? OK. Well, um, in interest of time, um, I'd like to uh, just make uh, some uh, uh, closing remarks. Um, I'd like to thank, uh, again, the uh, five uh, Japanese graduate students who have made this event possible. Um, I think they are all in this room. Um, here, if they could stand up um, and uh, 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 let us know who you are. Uh, Hiroki uh, Wakamatsu, Mihoko Tagawa, uh, Toru Yamada, Hisa Kobayashi, and Hisa Oshiro. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for your efforts. Um, of course, I would like to thank uh, the panelists. Unfortunately, Tim uh, is ill and he had to leave uh, early. But thank you very much for your time. And um, I think we all learned a, a lot about uh, uh, this uh, whole disaster. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I also would like to thank generous support from the Office of the President, International Office, and the staff in communications uh, for um, helping um, us out. And thank you all of you for participating today. Um, the, in the handout, uh, we have uh, the students have put together a list of uh, 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 organizations that are accepting donations. Uh, there are many others that are not listed here, but uh, we encourage uh, your sustained support uh, for Japan's uh, recovery. Um, thank you very much for your attendance. There are some refreshments in the back. Uh, the panelists have been asked to stay for a couple of minutes, um, so if you have any further questions, please feel, feel, feel free to interact uh, with them. Thank you very much.